Hey, folks, it's the man with the pinky ring and a New York thing. Forget about it. Bad Brad Berkwood. And you're watching another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report Web TV channel. Now hit that button and subscribe. Leave your comments below. Love having a conversation with you, folks. And I greatly appreciate all of my new subscribers from the United States and all around the world. I really do mean that from the heart. Tonight, tonight, tonight. Do I sound like I'm excited? Of course, I'm always excited when I have great guests, which is seems lately that I always do. She was and is a lady with a powerful voice, okay? Who had one of the biggest hits of 1980 when she was the front woman, lead singer for the band Lips Inc. Incorporated, who had that hit, wait for it, Funky Town. Yes, I know everybody's been waiting for it. I've been getting a lot of uh, DMs and so on. Can't wait to see this lady. She also sang lead vocals on designer music. And we're going to talk about these two great songs and much, much more on the Bad Brad Berkwood Show and what? The Ringside Report Web TV channel. You forgot? I reminded you. Forget about it. So without further ado, forget about it. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Cynthia Johnson. All right. Well, good evening and welcome, Cynthia, to the show. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I greatly appreciate you coming on. And I'm, I'm feeling, uh, uh, what's the word? In the, in the season, you got your snowman in the back. I see him. Yes. With his scarf on. <laughs> and you got, are those oranges or those tangelinos? Those are oranges. Okay. All right. Do you know the history of the Godfather whenever they had oranges in the scene? Do you know that? Do you know the deal with oranges? No. Whenever an orange showed up in a scene in The Godfather, which is Debbie and my favorite movie, somebody was getting whacked. So I hope that's not a subliminal message. <laughs> Nobody's getting whacked around here. <laughs> just in case I get something wrong, I don't want you to throw an orange at the screen. <laughs> no problem. No, it's just all about the fruit, all about trying to eat well and nourish the body, especially, you know, during this time. Okay. What yeah. I like to do is I always start out with my guests talking about uh, obviously the biggest thing going on in the world right now, the pandemic, COVID. And I always like to uh, ask my guests, um, how are you, you coping with it, uh, dealing, adjusting, and you got the floor. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot right now because uh, it, it, it's, you, so many people don't know how to arm themselves and take care of themselves. And we don't have any real information coming from our leadership that says this is the best way to take care of yourself besides the mask besides there are other things that you can do for your body to strengthen your body so it's it's kind of frustrating for me because i have a background in nutrition and uh the importance of eating properly fruits and vegetables nuts and seeds and, and getting to the basics in order to arm your your body um it's upsetting and, and no one seems to know how to really do that and so um i spend i'm coping fine i spend a lot of time uh preparing people who have gotten ill and then i juice and prepare salads and broth and take it to their house um so I'm doing a lot of that, getting up early in the morning, uh, juicing vegetables, going to the market, um, and buying fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. Yeah, and just trying to help somebody, because what do you do, you know? Right. Okay. So, is yeah. Your, is your state um, spiking now, or are they, how, how are they doing overall? Um... We're spiking. I think it, it has been climbing ever since uh, February or March, back when it, when it started. Um, there have been about um, 13,000 um, people who have come down with the virus that they know of, and maybe 300 plus who have died. Okay. And this is a small county. I mean, it's not very big here. So... Um, uh, 
and and I see it a lot uh, within the community, people who've gotten sick that I know about and that I'm hearing about. And um, so it's, it's on the move, no, no question. Okay. What I would like to do is I always like to go back and then work forward. Okay. So we're going to go back in time and uh, we're going to start out with, if my research is correct, you were born in the, the state of Minnesota, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Born okay. in Minnesota, yeah. What Spend city? Most of my time there, St. Paul. St. Paul, okay. Right, but most of my, um, my music life was spent in Minneapolis. I would take the bus to Minneapolis because I was um, part of um, several bands in Minneapolis. Um, so, you know, they're the twin cities. They're, they're um, sister cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Okay. St. Paul, Minnesota. All right. Minneapolis. Mem memories of young childhood growing up in, in St. Paul. I would have to say uh, getting together with my siblings. My mother used to be afraid of the storms. And uh, every time it rained or storm was on the horizon, she would gather us together and she would give us harmony parts and she taught us how to sing. That's and cool. so we would end up having to entertain her during <laughs> the storm. Okay. So she wouldn't be uh, frightened. And uh, that is a loving memory for me. Okay. Family-wise, musical family growing up? Or I, I, I know you, what you talk about singing, all, but was anybody musical in your family when you were really young? You know, my father played the saxophone. Uh, and uh, my mother was a director in the church choir. Okay. And pretty much that was it. There's no other uh, music history in my family. Um, okay. But I, I really grabbed onto it because it, it was such a loving time for us to all come together and entertain my mother. It was just, um, uh, I, I was actually the only one that really grabbed on to music. Okay. And you yeah. mentioned, which was my next question, uh, I know about the singing, but I also found out in researching you, and you mentioned saxophone, you play saxophone as well. Absolutely. So you had singing and, and saxophone, did one come before the other or did they go hand in hand? Actually, saxophone came first. Um, well, I, I, I grew up, you know, my mother taught us all to sing. So I guess that came first. And then around my fourth grade in school when uh, music was available, um, I took up the saxophone. I didn't want to play the, the sax. I wanted to play something more feminine and uh, there was nothing else left. <laughs> okay. So, so my uh, music teacher uh, convinced me to play the saxophone and uh, it didn't go over very well. My mother was very upset that I would choose um, the horn. She thought it was too much responsibility and you shouldn't do it and blah, 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 blah. And I thought that I would have to um, not play the instrument because she didn't like it. And I ended up, my, my, my music teacher convinced me if she didn't say a definite no, then I think you'll be okay. And so, I played it and stuck with it, and uh, it was a beautiful addition to my, my music life. Okay. Earliest uh, musical, uh, it could be groups or any, any artist, very early on though in your life, who were musical influences in the professional world? I would have to say Ray Charles, The Beatles, Elvis Presley, uh, Nancy Wilson mm. and James. Okay. Those were my earliest memories of music. Okay. A nice, a nice group. <laughs> and, and, as in a great group. It's like yeah. Fucking icons there. Okay. Yeah, I loved them all. Okay. Move ahead to if I, my year is right, 1976. Mm. Looked like it was a big year for you. If my research is correct. You won the 1976 Miss Black Minnesota USA? Yes, yes. 
That was interesting. I actually, um, and you know, every, everything was an opportunity for me to do music. And, um, I, I sang a gospel song that night and played the saxophone. And I think that was pretty impressive to people. There weren't a whole lot of female horn players at the time. And then I think that was sort of a, what pretty much cinched everything. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. And around that time too, you were in the band uh, Flight Time, is that correct? Yes, I was. Uh, Flight Time really um, inspired me to play the horn uh, on a different level because I was just playing in the school band and it had not occurred to me that um, being a musician was something that I really wanted. I grew up wanting to be an actress. And um, my mother said, I can't afford for you to go and I don't want you to leave. And that was the end of that. Okay. So I ended up, uh, I was singing uh, at a funeral. And a gentleman from high school that I knew, Joey Kareem came up to me and he said, would you like to audition for a band? And I said, sure. And it happened to be flight time. And um, I took the bus over to uh, the north side of Minneapolis. And there were nine guys there. Uh, my first real experience without my sisters. Okay. Um, and um, they had a huge horn section. And I was so impressed. No one was smoking cigarettes. No one was drinking alcohol. Uh, which I was deathly afraid of because um, it was so in my family. Alcohol was sort of uh, uh, in my family. And um, uh, I was impressed by their discipline and the fact that they were such gentlemen. And um, once they knew I played the horn, that was, that was it. Okay. So, yeah, it was great. It was great. Okay. And around that time, I, this is maybe out of context, but out of that, that time, it looked like, is that when you met um, and you, you wrote? Did you write with uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis early on? I actually wrote with Terry. Okay. Um, Jimmy Jam was not in the band at that time. Okay. Jimmy was in a rival band called um, Mind and Matter. And uh, we actually uh, ended up with one of uh, his keyboard players. Uh, okay. And we all wrote um, Jelly Bean uh, Johnson, the drummer mm-hmm. of the time. He was the uh, Flight Times drummer. And uh, we all wrote beautiful songs. We were, um, a lot of our material was original. Um, okay. And so, yeah, it was great. It was a great place to grow up because we inspired each other to write and to do better. And it was just a wonderful space to grow up in. And the same with uh, Prince and Andre Simone, all of those guys, they wrote. And it's just something that we all did. Oh, Andre Simone, Mr. Kelly's eyes. <laughs> yes. I love Andre Simone. In fact, he follows me on Twitter, but ah. he doesn't interact that much. But we we followed each other probably about 10 years. Oh my! Um, in around '78, you completed your undergraduate degree at the University of Minnesota Morris. Is that correct? Yeah, um, yeah. That was that was quite an experience. Um, I um, I started to get fearful that music wasn't going to um, pay the bills. And the guys in the band, they were, they were starting families. And even though we were still a band, um, it wasn't fruitful. I mean, we couldn't get a lot of gigs. And we were a black band from the north side. And you couldn't get a lot of gigs if, if you were an all black band. Okay. Um, we were a funk group for the most part. We did do jazz and fusion. Uh, but for the most part, we were funk and R&B. And uh, there was just no money in it. And I said, I got to do something that's going to that's gonna last. So I, I went off to school, and it turns out that I was getting 
a lot of work. I mean, I started to branch away from flight time and I would come back every weekend and do gigs, you know, with um, different bands because up until that point, I was exclusively with flight time. I felt a safety, you know, with, with all the guys and they were so respectful and such gentlemen. Um, I got a real sense of security in the business, but I needed some money. Okay. And so um, I went to college and that was the right thing for me, but I couldn't stay, I couldn't stay put because I'm starting to make money now. So I was back and forth and back and forth and it was a real exciting time for me. Did you, did you finish, you got your degree or did you finish up or you had to leave? I left. Okay. I left. The money, the money kept pulling me away. And it's like, you know what? I think I'm going to make a living in the music business. Okay. Yeah. And so I, um, I left and uh, it just got better from that point. Okay. Now, it looks like flight time after you left flight time, it kind of morphed into the time. Is that correct? That is correct. When uh, I left flight time um, for good, I mean, because when I was in college, I was still in flight time. I just started to, to gather more jobs and do more things and expand my horizons in the music business. Uh, when I left, uh, it was uh, not an official leave. I just sort of walked away. Um, um, I'm actually writing a book about this, uh, my journey into music, but uh, I sort of walked away. It was time to leave. You know how you get the feeling that you're, you're growing up? I mean, we were, we were kids um, and uh, I wanted more and I didn't feel like it was moving quickly enough. And so all the gigs that I was getting, I just sort of backed away. And um, then Jimmy Jam came on. Uh, Monty Moyer came uh, actually before I left. And Jimmy came as I was exiting. But I knew Jimmy because we were all on the north side. There were tons of bands. We were all rivals. And we all, we all respected and loved each other. Um, so I had a, a real fruitful time with those guys because they they taught me a lot of discipline that I didn't previously have before when I was working with my sisters it was a lot of distractions uh, with my sisters but it got real focused when I met the guys on the north side and um, yeah okay gotta ask you any let's I, I'll stay positive uh, any cool, because you mentioned both of them, but especially Prince, any cool stories uh, that aren't in the mainstream that can be positive things that people may not know of, of your dealings with Prince or, or Morris that you could share? I'd have to say, um, I remember one time, uh, Terry Lewis and I were in the studio, Creation Studio in Minneapolis. And uh, we were cutting some songs that we had written and Prince came in and um, you know he's a very quiet person always has been that way and spoke in a very low low tone and I you know I didn't do a lot of drifting off you know I felt safe with the guys in the band and I was not um, a social person in that way, I think I was a lot like him, where, you know, you don't say that much. And uh, we were just talking about the production of the song, what we, sh what we should do. And I forgot Prince was there. I mean, he just sort of blended into the room. And when he spoke, it startled me because he was so quiet. And he would speak in this low monotone voice, you know. And I looked around like shocked and said, oh my goodness, you're still here. <laughs> and so, I mean, 
And he was always that way. He, he always came across very quiet. And so when you seen him in the beginning of his career, the fact that he didn't speak much, you know, he, he wasn't comfortable speaking. He wasn't used to speaking. His um, expression was completely on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, he was a quiet guy. Okay. And he was, you know, quite the, my, my um, communication with him was very different than the guys. Um, they, you know, they, they like to shoot basketball and they would, you know, talk a bunch of crap. Uh, but when I was in the room, you know, they were very uh, respectful and uh, I couldn't be uh, more grateful for how they, they, they treated me and how, how kind and sweet they were. And they treated me like a lady and they were always gentlemen. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Okay. It could have been a totally different experience, you know? Right, right, yeah, okay. I wanna read a little note about this because it's so uh, relevant to your career. So in, nine, in 79 is when you went into the studio and that's when you recorded the album Mouth to Mouth on Castle, Castle Blanca Records, right? That is correct. I went in the studio as a session singer. Okay. Um, during that time, I was, like I said, I was spreading my wings, trying to see what it was like out there in the music business. I got in some supper club gigs, which I had never had before, a very classy gigs. And I was doing voiceovers and all kinds of things that I didn't know that I could make money at. And I got a call from a friend that said, hey, this guy's looking for you. Um, and I said, really? He said, yeah, his name is Steven Greenberg. He's, mm -hmm. he's recording some uh, music and your voice is the voice for it. And I said, really? I said, well, okay. In some kind of way, we, we connected. And um, I went in to do the session. And you know, when singers go in the studio, they, um, you know, you get the lyrics and you listen to the song and they put you in the booth and you interpret the song. And um, that's what I did. I got paid and it was over. I walked out the door. Uh, never to think that um, it would pop up again. I did four songs for his demo and um, that demo turned into the first lip sync album of four songs. Um, so I had no idea at the time that I was going to be a disco artist. I came from an R&B background and I was also like the radio child. I grew up listening to the Beatles and Elvis Presley and Karen Carpenter and Barbara Streisand was my favorite, my favorite artist. Um, and then I went into a funk background and a jazz background with flight time, writing and playing the horn. And, and it never occurred to me, never once did I think that I was going to sing disco. It was so far removed from anything I had ever experienced. Uh, so it wasn't even a thought. Not only that, when disco was becoming popular, um, it was taking work away from live musicians. Clubs were closing. We already had a small number of places that we could work and it made it really difficult. And so disco was not what I ever thought I would sing. So it became uh, quite the, the shock when um, what I thought my music career was going to be turned out to be something very different that I had to try to adjust to, mostly up here, because, you know, you love music, and most artists love more than one type of music. We get pigeonholed into doing one type. But I've always loved all types of music. But disco was not on that radar for me. And so it was, it was interesting. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. Well, Funky Town, the album was released in, it looks like in November 79. Funky Town enters the Billboard Hot 100 about March of 80. Uh, spent four weeks at number one from, if the, if the dates are right, from May 31st to Jan June 21st, 1980. I was 12 years old uh, when this song hit, it graduated in sixth grade, and we used to go to school dances, and they would put on the, uh, the record player, the front of the record player would fold down like this, it was all one piece, the speakers were here, the thing would fold down, you put the, the you know what I'm talking about, put the yellow, the yellow inserts in the 45, because they had 45s or two, and they put the 45 on, or sometimes they'd have the 33. So we would dance to the song. So it was a huge hit, part of my childhood. Now, yes. doing research, this is good, this is going to be fun because I, I want to get your take on this. So I'm going to be honest because I always am. I didn't know that you were the voice of Lips Inc. Now, the <laughs> research on you, I found out that the song that I love was sung by you. But in fairness to me, because I do my research, first of all, I'm gonna hold up a picture. This is the group, right? That's right. Okay, so this is the group. So you got, uh, I think, is that Steve? That's good, okay. yeah. Okay, we know that's you with that cool look, right? <laughs> right? So that's you, and that's the group, folks. Let me hold up for the viewers when I move my hand. So you- That's the group. Okay, now, here's, here's where the fun starts. All right. However, when the album came out, <laughs> I don't see. Hold on a second now. I know I'm not seeing things, folks. You so, sure aren't. So here is what we thought was the group, but here is what is really was the group and the amazing voice behind the hit. Not this one. So not that one. So you didn't do the Millie Vanilli thing. You actually sang where they didn't sing, but they were out front. It was reverse yeah. with you. It was reverse with me. They Millie vanilli me. <laughs> they Millie vanilli you. However, however, in researching you, Cynthia, I didn't know this either because I only saw YouTube is the bomb. I gotta, I gotta admit, it's like one of the greatest creations uh, that man made, at least. Absolutely. There's two videos. There's one video with the lady that's on this album or somebody that looks like her lip syncing. But there's another video. I don't know if that was the original video of you dancing, which it looked like it's the same video almost as the, what you're going to talk about designer music. But you guys like dancing in a clip, right? Did they have both videos at the same time? Actually, this is, you know, it's quite a tale. Go ahead. I'm all ears. Um, that album cover was a point of contention for me because I didn't know that was going to be the album. I cover. had a feeling you were going to say that, by the way. And I was the only person that was contracted. And I'm thinking to myself, how is it that I don't know this? That I'm not even present on the album and I'm the only person that is myself and uh, Stephen were the only people that were part of Lip Sync. And, you know, I was young and I'm thinking, hmm, something about this doesn't feel right. And um, at the time, uh, I had to sit with it because I hadn't recalled a conversation about the album cover and why would I be kept off of the album cover um, or even in the side, the jacket of the album. It, it was the beginning of an emotional um, tug and pull because now I was looking to find, and, and I must also say, I was in a marriage, because during the time I signed uh, with Lip Sync, and the time that Funky Town was hitting, I was signed, but doing absolutely nothing. I couldn't, you know, I didn't have, I couldn't sing with anyone else. 
it was not something that I could do. Um, it was, you know, I was learning the material in the mirror hmm. and I was in a marriage that turned abusive. Hmm. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. And it was, and so, and then I, I get this album cover and so I'm not feeling much love in the world here, you know? Uh, and uh, it was a real sore spot and it got worse. Then the, um, the video came out and I wasn't even asked to be in the video. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who those girls were. Right. When I seen it, I'm, and I'm like, this feels like I'm not even supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, uh, and between not feeling loved in my marriage, because being young, sometimes, you know, young people don't know how to handle the success of something like this. But the interesting thing is, I wasn't doing anything. I was like finding my own ways to sing as Cynthia Johnson because there was nothing going on. And then I ended up getting pregnant. Um, and I had my daughter. And somewhere down the line, Deborah Jenner comes out as Lips Inc., a white girl in Europe, pretending to be me. So now there are two products in the world pretending to be me, and I'm not on any of it. And the more time went on, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen be between being with the group and being uh, in my marriage and having this success that I was not connected to right. on purpose. Maybe I, I still don't know if I was blackballed because I had a lunatic of a husband. Mm. Uh, or the album cover had nothing to do with it because that happened long before my marriage. Okay. And so I felt like there was no love in the mix and that I didn't belong there. Because I came from, music pulled me in because of the love that I felt around me as a child, right. in my church choir, in my um, band with my sisters, with flight time. It was always a loving, embracing thing. I was almost so completely naive because as long as love was in the room, I was good. Right. Sounds and, like a Beatles, a Beatles song there. All we need is, it sounds like a Beatles song. All we need is love. But you find out we need more, though. We still need more. Hello. <laughs> because, and, and now I'm starting to feel all of this rejection and this, um, I don't even know what to call it, this turmoil, this darkness. And I couldn't understand why I was a part of it. I couldn't understand why am I feeling this rejection from the things that I love the most, my music, my husband, my partnership. And I didn't feel like anybody's partner. And so while the, the music was going up the charts and, and I couldn't play my saxophone. So I would be playing my horn at home, writing songs and my services weren't needed or asked for on that level in terms of being a musician. So let me, let me ask you this, tying into what you, you said. Something. So is that why, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was no um, bandstand, there was no um, uh, soul, there was no, there was no performance because I couldn't find any clips. You guys, you didn't perform at all. So you didn't tour at that point or anything, right? What I ended up doing is doing me because what I was doing, uh, well, and I must say that I, I did get pregnant during um, a 
a time that was important. My, my daughter was born August 1980. Okay. So I had my daughter. Um, but prior to that, there wasn't much going on. And I started working as Cynthia Johnson because legally I couldn't use, I didn't have any rights to the name. And so, and I was pretty much locked out of it all. And I couldn't figure out exactly why, but I couldn't let that get in the way because my music was, was love and light for me. It was joy for me. And I, the things that I couldn't understand, I had to just walk away from. And that's pretty much why you don't find a lot of stuff because lip sync went on. Uh, it, I was replaced. I, I, I left lip sync in 1983 and I was replaced by Deborah Laws and then, um, uh, um, Melanie Rosales and Margaret Cox yeah, so, yeah, so, became yeah. um, lead vocalist in uh, Lips 4, who eventually we ended up in a band together. We became wonderful friends. Okay. And most of the musicians that were Lips Inc. became some of my best buddies. Okay. But I, I think that who I was I felt I was not considered. I was completely left out of it from the beginning. And then of course my husband didn't help. And I thought to myself, I need to walk away from both of these things. Okay. In order for me to maintain my sanity, because if I'm locked out as a musician and I'm not loved as a wife and mother, then I'm in the wrong place. And so I backed out and I went to where the love was. And that was working under my name, writing, working with other artists. And I never used the name Lip Sync because I couldn't. Okay. Uh, I couldn't. And there was no visual point yeah. for people to consider me. So... I said, okay, I'm going where the love is. And that's what, um, that's what worked for me because uh, there was no love that I was feeling in what was happening. Everything was a tug and pull. Everything was a battle. Everything was a fight. And I was tired of fighting. I was tired of fighting. The last thing I should have had to fight for was whether or not I was on the, the album. Well, and so, and, and I eventually got on the album, but that was, there were battles. I bet. In between there. And it's like, I shouldn't have to fight for this. No more than I should have had to fight with my husband. Nothing felt like there was a balance. Nothing felt like it was where I belonged. And I had a false sense of security with flight time. They took care of everything. They were so respectful. Everything was wonderful. And here I meet this man who I married and all of that went out the window. And my music is something that I love the most that gave me the most security. And it wasn't, it wasn't working. And so, yeah, you don't find a whole lot. Okay. Um, and that's the reason why that's you reason. don't. Okay. Yeah. And Deborah Jenner uh, worked up as lip sync for years, for years. And, you know, somebody came to her and gave her permission to do that. I mean, you don't just, you don't just do that. As a matter of fact, she said it. So I'm not going, I, you know, I'm, I don't blame anybody because, okay. you know, you, I got my side of the story, and then there's another story. You well, know you what? Got I your mean? story. I, well, see, I'm glad that was a long tale, but I'm glad that you told that story because it's relevant. Because quite honestly, if I found that it's not, it's a secret. Other people have thought. See, that's why I like doing the interviews that I do 
because I like giving artists their chance to tell their side of the story. So I, I got to ask you with everything that you just said and being very detailed. Well, first of all, folks, this is the lady's voice that you hear on that. So the song that I love, okay, and danced to uh, in, in uh, the sixth grade at Treasure Island Elementary School in uh, North Bay Village uh, in Florida. This is the lady, this is the lady that gets the credit, not the person that you see on here. Right. <laughs> Once again, okay, this is not her. So I gotta ask you very bluntly, this song became, as you know, huge. There's still, it's still in the lexicon, I think that's the word, of music or when they talk. I think if I remember correctly, wasn't it using Shrek, the movie yes. Shrek? Okay, Absolutely. so I gotta ask you, I know you were a paid session singer, I guess. Did you partake in any of this or did you, did you get screwed or did you get your fair share of this song? I'm not asking for numbers, but I'm saying, did you get anything? Because this song was massive. Yes, both. Okay. I, I got both. I, okay. I got, you know, my, my father used to always say, whatever you accept in life is fair. And um, so I, fortunately, my uh, husband and I, uh, at the time, found an attorney in Atlanta. And um, thank God that that was the case. Because, you know, nobody loves you in the music industry. Oh, I know and, that's right. And you grow up thinking one thing and it always turns out to be the other. And the artist is usually the one who gets screwed. Yep. It's the people behind the scenes that navigate in their favor. Money. It happens a lot. And mm -hmm. I'm one of the lucky ones that actually did get paid because I actually did get an attorney and I actually didn't use the same attorney as, you know, I mean, you know. As we a music think, company that represents you and tells you, and I, and I can speak on this because I've had artists on my show, The Escape Club, they had the number one hit in the country, Wild Wild West in 88, not the Kumo D one, but the other one. Mm -hmm. And they, in the end, they didn't get anything and they had a lawyer that they trusted who worked for the music company that said to him, oh, we got you. I got your best interest at heart, which we know it was, I don't want to curse, but it was a bunch of crap. So I'm glad that you did. I'm, I'm glad it that you did. It happens all the time. Yes. And the music industry is designed that way. And what is so painful is that the musicians, like the producers and the managers and the, most of these people are musicians mm -hmm. and they don't have no love for you either and it's just it, it's not a world that i just feel any goodness about because people chalk it off as business so fortunately i did have an attorney and i did do what i thought was fair but but I still didn't get what I was supposed to even then because a lot of that was taken from me and I didn't fight for it because I was fought out. But I do get uh, um, what I signed for in the contract. And, and I'm happy about that because uh, even though there's a lot of darkness in my story because my ability to work was taken away from me. Right. You know, that I was uh, contained and kept in a little shell and put somewhere to the side. And um, that's even a, a bigger problem in some respects. It's one thing if you decide you're, you're not going to pay me for a couple of years and I need to figure out how to go get an attorney and you know that kind of battle but then you decide that i'm not gonna i'm gonna make sure you don't get any of the calls or any of the interviews or any of the that's a whole nother animal and i said okay this is a little too dark and a little too messy for me and i will just be me 
and that's how I've lived my music life. And fortunately, I've been blessed even still. And so... Oh, I know. We're going to talk about some of those blessings a little bit later. I got them in my notes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still grateful, even right. the battles that I couldn't wage and the battles I couldn't fight. I still uh, have fruit coming from my contribution. And I'm happy about that. I'm not so, uh, I'm not the kind of artist that feels like I need to be seen or I need to be um, um, validated by somebody who wants to keep me in, in a corner. I'm, right. I'm good. I'm, I'm, You're good and I understand that and I respect that. But I'm going to say it again because I'm one that always loves giving people credit. Yes. This lady that I'm talking to right now is the reason why you love that song. Because it was her voice, not the people that they put on the cover. So when you're still dancing to it or you're remixing, if it's a hook in a song, if it's a hook in a, another song and they use, this is the lady's voice. Now, moving on. You were, did you sing on designer music? Yes, I did. I did all three albums, all the okay. backgrounds. And let's, all let's go to designer music now, because something happens from uh, mouth to mouth. If this is, in fact, the is this the album cover? That was the album cover, and that was me, and, and I fought you. for it. I, th this right here, right? Yes. Okay, folks, let me put that right here in front of me. So this is her. Yes. This is your third album. Third I album. On Cas I think it was on Casablanca Records, too. Now, I'm going to let me give you a little insight to this. I believe I, it was actually on Polygram at that Okay, point. Polygram. Okay. I forgot about this song till I researched you. Now, I lived in Florida. I'm a New Yorker, but I, when my parents divorced, I, I lived with my dad from 75 to 84 okay. in South Florida. So we had a, a black radio station called WEDR, Soul Star. And they played this on there, which was, it was kind of, I hate to say disco, but it was, it was kind of labeled disco. It was coming towards the end, which I don't know if you saw this, by the way, Cynthia, have you seen the, um, kind of off topic, but did you see the documentary on the Bee Gees that aired Saturday on HBO? I did not. Watch it because I forgot about this guy who, who really was a creep when they had the whole thing in the stadium. His name is Steve something. I can't think of his last name. And they blew up the records and all that stuff. The disco, because I don't know if you remember. It'll be, oh, big story. I'll, I'll email you some links to it. Yes, but please. HBO had a, a thing called How Do You Mend a Broken Heart, the Bee Gees song. And it talked about this. So designer music kind of came at the very end of disco. But it had, I don't know if it was deemed disco. But I forgot about that song. And actually like that song, I love Funky Town, but I actually like designer music better. I'm not, it's, it's actually my favorite. Me too. Right. Talk about uh, going in now, being on the album cover and recording. And I know that was your last um, album with Lips Inc. And by the way, the Lips Inc, correct me if I'm wrong, Cynthia, was a play on Lip Sync. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I, I thought so. I thought I read that. Yes, it's a okay. play, on, on play on words. Quite okay, I, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Talk about going in the studio and recording what is, and like I said, I do love Funky Town, but I love designer music better. Talk about going in, being on the cover now, being, it, I guess, acknowledged finally, but I don't think still touring or doing anything as lips, right? Okay, I don't understand that part. But talk about going in the studio and talk about that particular song. Wow, that was so much fun. It was so much fun for me because when I recorded the first album, I didn't know it was my first album. It wasn't about me. And I, I felt like none of it was about me. But that album, the first album in particular, wasn't about me. I knew I was coming in the studio to do a job. And just like most vocalists that go in a studio for a product or a, a check, that's what it was about. And I knew that I needed to take what I learned and match the energy and blah, 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 and deliver a live performance. And I get paid and I walk away. When I did designer music, 
I knew that I was a part of a group, which was everything to me because that's what my experience had been. That's what I loved so much is being a part of the group where we all had a common, you know, a common goal. And, and uh, when we were all in sync and on the euphoria that I would feel, it was almost selfish for me to get in the music. I, I didn't feel like I was outside of it. I didn't feel, I was never the kind of artist that needed to be, I'm the star or I'm the front. I knew that I needed every instrument that was there that elevates me to a place that's very difficult for me to, un, to for me to explain it to somebody because it was, always an out-of-body thing for me that would happen. When, uh, so when I did designer music, I knew that it was a band that I was going to encompass in, and we were going to be a family. And um, it was so much fun. Those violins mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of the music that was in there was just, I had learned to to like what was happening. Because the first album, like I said, I wasn't connected to it. Uh, and I became connected later and then still didn't feel a part of it. Okay. And so um, there was a lot of turmoil still going on because it started with the first album. Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing is hard to shake. And there's other little things that were happening that were difficult to shake. And I was in a bad marriage. I was still in a bad marriage, not having my band friends because my friends, Prince, Terry Lewis, David Island, Jelly Bean Johnson, then uh, Alexander O'Neill. Oh yeah, I loved Alexander. Sue Ann Carwell, all of these people were away from me and I couldn't ac access them. And I didn't want to burden them to figure out how, what do I do here? How do I, I, I don't feel respected. I don't feel acknowledged. Yes, I have the cover, but I want peace. I want some love. I want, I want partners. I want, a family of musicians mm -hmm. because that's all I knew. And so I was just in such a strange place. Then I ended up, um, you know, at that point I acknowledged that I got to find some love or I'm going to, I'm going to lose it here. And that's when I backed away and I didn't just back away. I'd gotten a release um, because I had, you know, if I remember correctly, like I said, there's my recall and then there's another recall. It's not always uh, what I say, but what I was feeling right. is I don't feel respected or seen. And I don't know, we got to fix it. And I ended up getting a release. And at that point, I said, okay, I mean, what do you do? And then I started working with other bands. I started working with people who needed people to work on their, uh, write their background parts, help them develop songs. I became that. Okay. And, uh, and then I, you know, started working with um, Sounds Blackness and yep. I just took a bunch of gigs. Okay. And uh, a bunch of theater work. And, and I didn't, I didn't, um, feel that I had given up anything. Okay. You know, because I was able to um, be with my children. It was a different life, but it was, I, I was all right with it. Okay. Yeah. Moving on a couple years, found what I call, I always love finding what I call chestnuts. And I found one on you. Ah. 
found a video and it looks like the date was June 1st, 2001, live from the Fitzgerald Theater with you out front singing with the ABC Youth Choir, <laughs> performing Higher Ground, right? Yes. Okay. Let me tell you, <laughs> I love this performance. Did, did I say I loved? I love this performance. Oh. First of all, folks, watch the video, Higher Ground, with Cynthia on it. You're going to notice two things. One, that she could sing her, her butt off, <laughs> which we already knew that. Two, it looked like she must have been pumping iron because she's got arms that are like, <laughs> you'll see what I'm talking about. That's funny. <laughs> but you had all the young people behind you, and they were dancing, and I was feeling it. I, that was that was a fantastic, and your voice just was out there. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I, lo I love that performance. Talk about that recording or that, that night or however it went down. Talk about that. That um, church was the church that my mother went to. Okay. And um, Nate Saban was one of the um, writers at the church. Um, I'm trying to remember the pastor's name. How could I forget his name? And they had such an amazing youth choir. Oh, yes. Oh, they were just amazing. And they were writers and they were full of energy and they were full of wanting to bless God and mm -hmm. write music. And they had found out that I was a vocalist and they said, would, would you please sing with our choir at our choir concert? And I thought, absolutely. I mean, these kids were electric and, yes. and so amazing. And they shined so much that night. And it was just a beautiful night. The whole concert was amazing. And those kids were. I, I was looking at the, 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 uh, the, there was a church you said, right? Well, that, that was at the Fitzgerald. Yeah, was, uh, the, okay, I'm sorry. Fitzgerald. It looked like, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed like that place had good acoustics. Because, I mean, it sounded great. I don't know if that was, you know, it cleaned up maybe in the recording, but it sounded great. I no, mean, it, it, sound. was, it, was, it was a live recording. Okay. And the theater is a small theater. Okay. The Fitzgerald downtown St. Paul. And it was just great. And the audience, the place was packed. And it was just, those kids, they just warm my heart. Every time I think about them, it just, they just warm my heart. They, they were so awesome. So awesome. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And like I said, go to YouTube, higher ground, type her name in, boom, it'll be right there. You're going to love it. And then leave a comment on the show. Okay, yeah, you had awesome. mentioned um, Sounds of Blackness. I was actually going to ask you about that. Yeah. So you moved on and you were, you were, were part or are part of Sounds of Blackness, which I know is a Grammy Award winning group. I've, of course, I've heard of them. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that experience. Um, Sounds of Blackness, I actually um, became a member of the Sounds before Lips Inc. Okay. Um, the Sounds was a community choir that started at McAllister College by uh, Russell Knight and Gary Hines. They were the um, the founders of the Sounds of Blackness. Um, the Sounds um, do every type of music there is except for disco. They do, um, you know, um, the blues, rock, soul. They do slave chants and spirituals. They take the history of the African American and they bring it all the way up through time. Okay. And uh, the sounds was that family love that I always wanted. It's the thing that's been consistent in my music career is that there needs to be love surrounding the music and there needs to be that family bond. And they had that for me. They had uh, all of those elements and I was able to be creative, which is something that was always fostered when I was in flight time. And I've always sort of held that as my guideline in the music business that I'm going to go where I feel love. Otherwise, I just don't belong there. And I'm glad that I held that principle because it's kept me safe. 
it's kept me from veering off into addictions, which is very, um, which is in my family history. I think I told you that before. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been able to be grounded sticking with those principles. And so uh, sounds was just an automatic thing that felt like a hug for me. And, okay. and once you're in the sounds of blackness, you're always a member. So Gary still will call me and say, can you do this gig? Can you do the A Night Before Christmas? Can you play this role? Can you... And it's a wonderful thing. So I'm still a member. Okay. As a matter of fact, my daughter's even a member of the Sounds. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I recently interviewed, um, remember the show Barney Miller? Oh, of course. Okay. I recently interviewed Hal Linden, the actor who played Barney Miller. Yes. And you, if, if this is correct from what I found out, you and Hal have something in common, just different eras. Really? In the 60s, he was a singer, and he recorded commercial jingles. Yeah. You recorded commercial jingles, is that oh. true? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so you have that in common with Hal. So what I got to ask you, because YouTube may or may not have one of my viewers are going to be like, oh, we got to go and see if we can hear it. What's some of the jingles that we may know you from? Oh, oh there's so many. My goodness. Oh my goodness. You know, I, I don't stay married to those things. Okay. I, I go in the studio, I do the work and it's a done deal. Okay. One, one commercial that I really loved that I did, the song was amazingly written and I'm trying to remember who was the producer on the job. It was a Rite Aid commercial. Oh, the drugstore. Yes. He's own stock in them. <laughs> really? Yeah, he made a lot of money off of them. Yeah, I mean, it was a great song, commercial, and it was, it became quite popular. Okay. Uh, for the jingle itself, but I've done a lot of jingles. Okay. I mean, a lot of products, a lot of products. Okay. Yeah. I'm just not married to any of them. Rite Aid is the only one I remember because it was such a great song. Okay. I've, I've done radio... Um, you know, songs for the radio stations. Right, right. Um, lots of them. Okay. I mean, I'm in my 60s, you know? <laughs> that's a lot of jingles. You say like that's a bad thing. I'm not going to say 60 because I'm 52, and I get tired at 52 is to do 22. No, it's not. No, no. no it's not. I wish it was. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I still try to, you know, do what I can, but 52 is not the new 22. They need to no. stop that. They need to stop That's that. That's right. No matter how healthy and well you eat and you can do all those things, it's still not the new 22. That's exactly okay. right. So out of curiosity and uh, watching you now in the interview and, and, and talking, we still got more to go, but you had mentioned acting. I know you said your mom said she couldn't afford to put you into acting, but just out of curiosity, because I didn't find anything and maybe there's something here, maybe there's not. Mm -hmm. Did you do any uh, stage or did you do any type of stuff to, to kind of you know what that I, urge? I did a lot of theater. Um, okay. I did a lot of theater, not as much as I would have liked to have done uh, because music always pulled me away from theater. But my... Funnest role, and of course I did a lot of acting roles with the Sounds of Blackness because they did a lot of theater. Okay. But my biggest uh, and most emotional consuming role was um, Lady Day at the Emerson. And I'd done that just in local theater. I didn't, you, you know. You said Lady Day? Yes. Is, I that, didn't, Billie, is that Billie Holiday? Is that's that Billie Holiday. Yeah, right, that's what I thought. It was... Um, the most emotionally draining experience I'd ever had because I, I had done crowns and I had um, spoken with the, the theater uh, um, producer who produced the, the production. Uh, and I said, if you ever come across a challenging role, um, I would love for you to consider me for the part. Okay. And she, she came up with um, 
Lady Day at the Emerson and that uh, it was quite deep for me. It was quite emotional for me. I'm very, I'd like to say that I'm a person that's very empathetic. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I don't have to have gone through something to feel someone else. And I totally felt her role and her position. And uh, of course, when I, I took on the role, I didn't realize that that part was a one woman play. Oh, I, wow. I know. And I got the, the script and I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be the role of my life right here. Well, and it, would, it be, would it be in a one woman play out of curiosity? Did it start with strange fruit or around? Did it have strange fruit in there? Talk about that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. It was in there. And, um, um, yeah, it was, um, I mean, all I can do is shake my head, you know, at her life. And the interesting thing is, my, you know, my mother didn't want me to go into the music business. Okay. Um, she was very um, protective. She was a hardworking woman who um, was divorced. She had five daughters and one son. She worked long hours at 3M Company, and she didn't want me to be uh, a singer or a saxophone player. And she would tell me, she would say, Cynthia, if you're in this career, you could end up like Billie Holiday. And she was just afraid. And I didn't know who Billie Holiday was at the time when my mother was having this conversation with me. And it was interesting that I would come all of this way through all types of scripts and all types of music experience, hearing and, and, and feeling my mother's fear for, of addictions and all of that. And then to end up with this script about Billie Holiday and her addictions and her life. It was, mm -hmm. it was really something for me to play her. Well, I'm gonna piggyback off of you with Billie Holiday because I love Billie Holiday. And like I said, I always, I always straight honest and, and tell the story just the way it is. I wasn't, the, my father, God rest his soul, was 40 years my senior. So he was born in 1928, I was born in 1968. Mm -hmm. So I grew up on all of his musical tastes. And, and one of them, was Francis Albert Sinatra, which is my oh. down favorite singer of all time. Absolutely. His favorite female singers were, female was Sarah Vaughn first. He loved oh, Sarah yeah. Vaughn, Ella Fitzgerald, and Billie Holiday. And when I was a kid, I always loved Sinatra, but I couldn't get into Billie Holiday. Well, my uncle Stan, who was in the music business, knew her personally, okay, in New York, when she lived in New York, and he lived in New York, in the city. He kept saying to me, Bradley, Bradley, you got to listen. You got to listen. I, said, I can't get, I can't. I didn't understand Strange Fruit. I was too young to understand yeah. the lyrics. Oh, I know it and I get them now. But I, I, honestly, I couldn't get into it. Finally, he sends me maybe 20, 25 years ago. Um, he had a machine that would take albums and make CDs and he would send everybody CDs. He recorded Billie Holiday's, I think it was 1946 or 47 album, Lady in Satin. Oh, yeah. And it had You've Changed, and it had, which is my favorite song with that she's, I know she's had other ones, but That's I love you, you've, you've Changed. And it also had, because Sinatra had, I won't say a hit, but had the, the recognition on I'm a Fool to Want You. And Billy did it. When I heard that CD, and I think the arranger was Ray, I don't know why I'm thinking Ray Noble. I think it was Ray Noble. Yeah, I, I don't recall. That I don't recall. But when I heard that album of Billie Holiday, from that day, I called him on the phone when we, before we had cell phones and I said, you got me. I love Billie Holiday. I get her. I understand her voice is one. And Sinatra, a daughter. Sinatra loved her. You knew, you close your eyes. There's only one, certain song, certain singers, there's only one of. That's true. One Billie Holiday. Nobody can duplicate her. That's true. Whether you love her or you don't love her. That's right. Nobody can do, you could try. 
That's right. There was, there was Billie Holiday. You know, you have those once in a lifetime artists and she was one of them. So I can imagine, I would love to see, you don't have it, you don't have it on DVD or anything, do you? Your performance by chance? No. Ah. No. I would love to see, but I'm gonna tell you, when you talk about Billie Holiday, it resonates with me because like I said, an amazing artist who battled her demons, she died I think in 59. In fact, mm -hmm. I'll tell you one more story about Billie Holiday. Uncle Stan's uh, partner was a songwriter named Jack Reardon. Mm -hmm. He, he co-wrote a song called The Good Life and a couple other ones. He, he recorded, I mean, he wrote a song called Involved Again. Uncle Stan went to Billy's, I, I'll send you a link of it. It really <laughs> didn't, it would have been a standard, but it didn't, it didn't, she was going to record it. Oh. So they went to her apartment in New York City. And when they opened up the door, Jack was a square. Uncle Stan wasn't a square. So they walk in and there's all this smoke. Well, you know what kind of smoke it was. It wasn't cigarettes. <laughs> and he's like, what is that? And he was that square. He said, he said, just breathe in, you'll be fine. And it was, of course, marijuana smoke. And in the back was Billy at the piano. And, and Jack, is, was, he was, he passed away, a Caucasian man. And <clears throat> she had the, the, the um, sheet music for it. So she was playing it, she said, and you know how she talked in that, that voice. She said, you wrote that song? She said, you wrote one hell of a song for a white boy because it had like a, it had a, a, like a soul feeling. Uh -huh. he, young. he was like, Jack was probably then, he was probably about 23, 24 years old. And Billie Holiday was already, you know, iconic at that point. Mm -hmm. She was going to go in the studio and record it. And unfortunately, she passed before she recorded that song. I'll send you a oh link to Oh my gosh, yes, but please send me the link. I will, let me write, let me write a note to remember. You know, the, 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 it's, uh, it's a taste that you have to grow into. Yes. Because I didn't like Billie Holiday either. Growing up as a young artist, I mean, I wasn't ready for her. You know, it, it came later on. And then of course I heard, uh, I seen the movie that Diana, yeah, Diana Ross did. And I like Diana's version better. Diana was a pop singer. And right. you, could, you could hear the pop in her voice. And that's, you know, uh, so it took me some time to come around to liking her. Just like you said, I liked Sarah. I liked right. Ella. You know, I, I liked uh, Frank Sinatra. I liked Doris Day. Yeah, uh, really was too. not in my... Right wheelhouse until much later on and i'm telling you every night when i played her role i was in tears yeah and not only was i in tears i was playing uh you know it's a role where you're high the whole time right and it was exhausting i bet, I bet. oh my goodness so yeah i still love theater but i'm telling you being an empathetic person that was a lot for oh yeah me. definitely yeah so okay very interesting up until that point so singing saxophone two loves we obviously the viewers you could tell how much cynthia loves both but i'm going to ask you the hard question and you may or not may or may not be able to answer this singing or saxophone is there one over the other i would have to say singing because um, I'd have to say singing because um, it feels like an expression of my soul. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, an emotional connect where I could be, if I'm on the horn, I can play it and it doesn't have to connect to how I really feel. But if I'm singing and I feel some kind of way, it comes out in my vocal. Okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm connected. My soul, my spirit is connected to the sound that comes out of my body when I'm singing. And the connection between the band members and the drummer and the bass player and the keyboard player and the horn players, I feel like I'm a, some sort of cell that's being electrified by every person who is a part of the music. 
and then the audience is shooting these um is shooting something into me okay and i'm giving it back and it just feels like some sort of uh universe thing you know where uh, i'm a planet and everyone is feeding and taking energy and feeding and it's it's an experience that can't really be matched by much okay for me it's a, it's a very um personal thing for me so okay. singing uh would have to be i mean the saxophone is great and i love it but it's it's not the same thing okay and i want to uh make an observation of something you said for the viewers that are that are watching you heard uh, cynthia earlier say that she loved doris day barbara streisand ella fitzgerald african-american artists caucasian artists oh yes and, and you're an african-american woman obviously but here's the point yeah. that i'm making i always say if there's one thing because the world is a mess. It's not just the United States of America. It's a the world is a mess. The world. And the world is a mess. And it's not just COVID. COVID is a terrible thing. That's right. We were a mess way before COVID came. Yes. And I've always said, uh, when, especially when it comes to racism and stuff like that, that one thing that really does bring people together and bridges color, uh, sexual preference, um, religious ideology, whatever, whatever it may be, is music it's his music. music it's and music. you prove that by naming some of the artists that you like you're not you're not in a box you like which you like oh. doris day as well as ella fitzgerald oh Early yeah holiday as well as frank sinatra you know absolutely you're, you're eclectic in your taste and i tell people come out of your box you know it, you know we being in the military be, well not being when i was in the military i was in the military for 20 or 20 days and he used wow. to tell my, my young troops that would say to me, um, they were never around, uh, they were never around a, a black person or an African, yeah. black, they said with black, or it could be a black person said, I really wasn't exposed to white people. Yes. I would say, well, you want to know something that I understand. I understand. So some things you don't know, you have to learn, but I'd, always, right. tell, I'd, I'd always say, but what do you, what type of music you guys listen to? And they'd be like, what do you, what do you mean? And they would be, and the white guys would say R and B artists, or they, they might have said rap, or they might have said whatever type of music. And then the brothers would say somebody that they're like, hold, hold on a second, that's not a black. No, it's not a black. Because music transcends it all, and it can it can bring you together. And that's what is is the beauty, and that's why I have such a um, immense respect for musical artists, no matter whether they're just a local guy at, at a pub performing. Even yeah. if he's do he or she is doing covers, and that's all they're ever going to do. And I'm not putting them down. There's nothing to the matter with that. That's Who's right. The biggest star in the world, Sinatra or Billy Holiday. The joy oh. that, that music brings to people. Oh my goodness! It's just it's amazing. And when you talk about it, and I've had all these other musical artists, the, singing those songs, like you said, singing even though you love the saxophone, because it gives you that that feeling with people. Mm-hmm. There you go. And it then it and again it bridges because when you look into your audience, you don't know. I mean, you might see color, but right. you don't know what somebody you don't know if they had a bad day, a good day. But right. They might have had the worst day in the world, but they come and see you and you sing a song, whatever it is, and you bring them joy. Oh my and goodness. Does that? Oh my goodness. And the love that you feel from the audience is amazing. Yes. And and I feel so blessed to be able to receive it right and to turn around and give it back in some way to make someone happy i mean it's it's been such a blessing in my life and and i'm grateful for the diversity for my white brothers and my black brothers and my mexican brothers that we have played together mm -hmm. and loved one another i mean through the music yes. because when mu when musicians get on that one accord it doesn't happen with every gig and every night some nights it feels like a job mm -hmm. and you know people say well what what, are, what music do you listen to and i'm like when i'm done gigging i'm not listening to nothing 
I'm just, you know, decompressing. But the unity that happens is you can't, and you chase it like a junkie chases yeah. some right. drug. You right. chase this feeling that happens and to be a part of it is such a blessing. And I wish that I had been able to experience that with my brothers in Lip Sync, which was not a diverse group. I had to fight to get one black person in that band. Somebody that I knew, I wanted somebody, I wanted to pull one of my flight time brothers in the band, somebody that would be a, a uniter and just to pull us, because I didn't know any of those people. Right. And so when I couldn't pull them into the group, I'm like, well, can we diversify? Can we get, you know, can, can we get some, you know, other folks in here to make it feel, you know, like we're representing everybody? Mm -hmm. And it was a battle. And then we got, we got the one person in the band who was not going to do well with the other people because I knew him and I loved him. We grew up on the same block, but he was the wrong man for the job that needed to feel like love. Okay. You know what I mean? Oh, that I needed mean. to feel like home and needed right. to feel like musicians because all the other musicians, I grew to love them, you know, but you know, you got to, I needed to pull from my experience and I couldn't have any experience. Okay. And so I made sure that everywhere else I went, that that was at the forefront and okay. that connection and that love that I get can't be matched by anything. And I have no regrets because the love is real. That energy, you know, I, I get the energy from you. And, you know, we don't have any sort of history. Right. But I can feel you. And that's important to me. Right. That's very important to me. I can't. Oh, I, I feel the same way. It can't be replaced by anything. Right. You, you know, you, you know, usually, though we know people could be full of crap, and I'm going to make a, a, a comment before we go into the second part of the interview or something you said. Um, in fact, let me write a little note here because I want to come back to it. Don't mention people full of crap. You, right. <laughs> don't get to talking because, you know, my name, Cynthia Johnson, there's been a political thing going on with this representative name. Oh, Cynthia, Cynthia uh, wait, wait, no, no, Who, which one are we talk? Don't tell me the QAnon, that's not her name. I don't QAnon, know, she's, she's Green. a black politician. Okay. And I'm getting hate mail. Really? Yes, because they think I'm the politician who said she, she apparently said something. I'm getting off subject, but no, you, you, go ahead. Just talking about people just full of crap. Tell I, me, please tell me she's not a Trump supporter. Well, no, she was, she said something against Republicans, okay. you know, to tread lightly and watch what you're doing because blah, 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 blah. You know, we're not going to take this, you know, whatever you guys are doing. Something she okay. said like that. And she started getting hate mail, you know, all kinds of, you know, she was relieved of her, of some of her duties politically. Okay. What state? Detroit. Okay, I have to look her up. Yeah, okay. Cynthia Johnson, the, the politician. Okay, I'll look her up. And I'm getting hate mail. Oh, geez. Because they think that's me. And anybody who goes to my website, CynthiaJohnson.net, can certainly scroll <laughs> through it and see. That you're not that a politician. <laughs> I'm not the pot. We don't look similar either. Right. Okay. We're both black. But I'm getting hate mail. And it's oh, like, I started, I started replying to the people, you know? Jeez. Isn't that terrible? Yeah. But you know what? Some still won't believe it. Because oh you, got you got people that believe that there's mass voter fraud. But anyways, oh. <laughs> don't even get me started. But uh, <laughs> you, you made a point where you said diversity in a group that it looks like everybody. Well, hey, let's be honest. Whether you voted, oh, I mean, vote now. But whether Joe Biden, which he wasn't originally my, my first selection for candidate, 
I did vote for him. I have no problem saying it. It was not my first, second, or third choice, but that's okay. Because yeah. in the end, I voted for him. And, uh, and uh, Vice President-elect Harris is part of the ticket. I voted for him. Yes. But his cabinet is, and I've said this before, unlike the guy that I call in the QVC house, because it's not the White House no more, because they're selling my pillows and everything else. So it's the, Q, it's the QVC house. You're killing me. <laughs> so where his cabinet had Ben Carson, and Ben Carson really doesn't know who he is. Yes. Um, that was it. That was the only person of color in there. And I don't even think Ben Carson realizes that he's a person of color. And yeah. I, 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 people don't misinterpret what I said. I said he doesn't know that he's a person of color. Because when he leaves... <laughs> When he leaves the, the HUD position, mark my words, folks, you're going to find out everything that he didn't do when he was the secretary of HUD. Because oh, people think sure. it's bad now. Wait till everybody comes out of those positions and we really find out how they screwed the country. But the, the point that I was going to make off of what you said, Cynthia, was it looks like the country. His cabinet picks so far, yes, they have to get confirmed. But it looks like, as it should, Black, white, women, men, straight, gay. It looks like America. The mo and don't get me wrong, you should pick the most qualified people, period. We need the most, at this particular Absolutely. juncture, we need the most qualified people. So I tell people of any any group, whether, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Hispanic, step back a little bit. I know we're very emotional, but step back. We want to see somebody that represents us, but we want the best of the best. Because what we're dealing with now, we have a lot of stuff to fix. So just use, you know, use your God given or use your common sense because not everybody believes in God. I do, but not everybody does. So out of respect to that, use your, use your common sense, step back and realize we got to get the best people into these positions because we got to fix what this mama Luke, as I call them, did for almost five years. Okay. There's a lot to fix. There's a lot to fix. But with that said, let's segue into the second part of the interview, which is just random fun questions. Okay. No right or wrong answers. Whatever comes to you uh, spontaneous, that's the answer. Okay. All right. First question out the gate. Favorite genre of movies? Oh. I would have to say adventure sci-fi. Okay. I, I like um, like the Avengers, and I like sci-fi, so that's why I say um, adventure and sci-fi put together. Okay, <laughs> no, you know what? A lot of lot of the musical guys. Um, Trevor Steele was a lead, is the lead singer of the Escape Club. He likes sci-fi, and he said he he said he actually said he's a sci-fi geek, and he watches. Um, He's got it on DVD. He says he's watched it six or seven times the whole, the whole series. I think it's called Babylon 6, I think it's called, or something like that. But he, oh, he, was, yeah. in, he, he was into that. Okay, so adventure and sci-fi. I usually say one. I know that's hard. But one or two so the viewers can get a feel for you. Favorite adventure or sci-fi movies that are your go-to movies that you can see over and over again? Ah, You know, I like so many movies. Okay. That it's um, it's hard to say. I like all most of the Avenger movies. Okay. Uh, the Avenger comic book movies that uh, you know that uh, like the Hulk. Okay. And I like uh, I even like a movie that was neither of those called Major Pain that Wayne's did. Yeah, yeah the Wayne brother, Damon Wayne's. <laughs> it's a family movie. Okay. I could watch it over and over again. I like, I've never been a big fan. So for me to say sci-fi, I've never been a big fan of Star Trek. Okay. Or, you know, the ones that everyone loves, but I like the, the idea of going into space and finding a creature and all of these things. There's so many, there's so many movies that I like. I like um, The Terminator and The Predator. Okay. Um, so let me ask you this sci-fi and see how, how kind of sci-fi, but more, um, just not just sci-fi. Are you a fan of the, not through all the remakes, but the original Twilight Zone? Oh, I love every last one of them. Yeah. Well, and I've, I've seen every one of them. Yeah. 
I love the Twilight Zone. Well, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Which one comes to your mind? The one where the guy wanted to read everything and not be bothered by people. And I'm gonna tell you who it is. Who? Burgess, Burgess Meredith, who played Mickey and Rocky, his trainer. And he played the penguin, he played a lot. He was a big actor one time. And at the end of the episode, unfortunately, he steps on his glasses. Oh my gosh! I think, I, I think it was called, it might've been titled, I have to look, Debbie likes that one too. Not, not enough time, I think is the name. Oh, of yes. And I was crushed. Yeah, yeah. Great one. I like all of them. They I have the bomb. What blows up? The bomb blows up and he's got all the books. Yes. He's just reading. He doesn't have all the distractions, but then he breaks his glasses. And he can't read a well, book I, and he's alone. I know. I know. Crazy. Oh. Yep. Okay. Who is your personal favorite musical band? Oh, that is so unfair. It is not even possible. Okay, two. I, you know what, what who comes to my mind first? Okay. I'd have to say Earth, Wind, and Fire. A great band. Because, um, and they popped into my mind because they left such an impression when I was young. I seen them in concert at McAllister Co uh, College in Minnesota. And I was just in awe of everything that was happening on the stage. The saxophone player, Maurice White, Philip Bailey, the, the rhythm section. I just sat there like with my jaw on the ground the whole time. And that's got to be the first concert that everybody was kicking. The audience was loving it. The band was electric. And so I would have to say that um, they left a huge impression on me. Okay. Um, there are so many All great... right, no, that's good. I'm not going to put you on that. You can't okay. Stop. Yeah, there you go. I okay. know it's a tough question. Okay, so I'm going to tease you and add a little bit of uh, visual for the viewers. So you see she has the bottle of wine back here. So this will tie in good with my question. Really? So being a singer... A romantic evening. Now, I'm not going to say how romantic. I'm just, it could be just candlelight dinner. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, Where you go with that from there, that's up to you. But you're, you're setting the table with candlelight and you're going to have a romantic dinner with whomever. Okay. Who are you putting on musically? Oh, I'm going to put on a variety tape and there's going to be jazz as well as uh, Anita Baker. There's going to be some old school um, Doris Day and Peggy Lee. There's going to be Luther Vandross. There's going to be um, Bobby Caldwell. Mm, what do you think there's there? going to be... Right, this uh, is going to be more than romantic, but okay. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be Grover <laughs> Washington. Oh, Lord. Oh, there's going to be... There's going to be... A, it's a mixtape. Okay. <laughs> It's a mixed day. Right, I'm, I'm gonna let the viewers under, uh, go why I'm laughing at the one because that's gonna be more romantic even. Okay, yes. <laughs> all right. That's that's a great compilation. Very good. Okay. Favorite, if you have one, if not one or two, but whoever comes first to your head doesn't mean that's the only one. I know it's a tough question, but solo male singer. I love Kirk Elling. Okay. He's a jazz man. Mm -hmm. I love um, little Jimmy Smith. He's a jazz man. I love. Uh, well, let me let me ask you. What, I'm gonna stop you, at little Jimmy Smith. Is little little Jimmy Smith? I think I think I know who he is. Is he the one? And if you might not, maybe you saw us. So you didn't. He almost sounds. I know he's, he's passed away, right? Yes. Doesn't he almost sound like Billie Holiday a little bit? He sounds like Nancy Wilson to me. Okay. But is he the one that Joe Pesci got with? Joe Pesci? I got a, there's a guy named Little Jimmy something. I don't, you said Smith, right? Yes. Okay, when we get done with the interview, I'm going to look it up. I'll email you. There yeah. was an artist that was from New Jersey. He never made it big, but he was popular. That's him. He record. I'm almost positive. Black I could guy. be wrong. A black guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right, right. Black guy. Very tiny dude. Very, really small. 
recorded. He did record. If it's the same guy, and I could be wrong because I've listened to him, he did a cover of The Nearness of You, which is a great standard. Oh, that's him. He recorded no. you. Oh, you don't know. Oh, oh, wait till I send you this. You're gonna, that's you're gonna, him. Okay, you're going to take one of those bottles of wine back there and pop it over. I know the song. I know the one you're talking about. He recorded Joe Pesci, put him in the studio. You know Joe Pesci is the of actor. Of course. Because Joe sings. I'm not saying Joe is great, but he sings. He put him in the studio with him and they record. I'm going to sing it. I'm going to sing it. Joe Pesci sing? Joe Pesci. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to send it to you. He sang on the nearness of you. Jimmy died like a year later because Jimmy, if, if it's the same one, I know it is. He was in New Jersey and Joe talked about back in the sixties, he used to go to these lounges and Jimmy was there and it was very segregated in New Jersey. And Joe's an Italian, as you know, and yeah. he, but he loved Jimmy and they, oh. and he said it was rare for an Italian and a, a, a black guy to bond. Yeah. And Jimmy took them every, and they fell in love with each other. I'm going to send oh. it to you. They recorded an album. He was wonderful. Yes, he Not sure him. was. And he, he used to come to Minnesota and sing at the Dakota. Light-skinned guy. He's light-skinned. Yes. Right? That's yes. him. That's him. Real, real little guy. And yes, tiny. Nancy Wilson, when you listen to him okay. play some of her stuff, she mimicked him quite a bit. Okay. I, I believe yeah. it. I'll check him out. Okay. I'm going to send it oh. to you. I got a note to send you that. I'm going to be sending you an email with a bunch of stuff. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Jimmy was amazing. Um, I like, uh, I'm trying to think more up to date. No, that's cool. You're good. You're good. You covered it. <laughs> okay. You're good. You like who you like, even though it's up there. No, you're good. Now, female singer, you said Barbara Streisand. You're going to go with Barbara because the flip is who's your favorite female singer? Um, I'd have to say there's a few Barbara okay. Streisand. Chaka Khan, lover, Karen Carpenter. Okay, the the uniqueness of those three vocalists um, just really lit my world completely up, especially Barbara Streisand, because I grew up listening to Barbara, and I learned all of her songs, and then when she did that album with the uh, one of the the Bee Gees guy, yeah, Barry Gibb, oh, the woman I, in love. Oh my goodness. I mean, Barbara is hands down the woman I wish I could have sang with, um, you know, just once, just one time. Um, Did you see the early clips of her when she was on a Judy Garland show? Yes. And the, her acting ability. Yeah. And directing. And, and directing. She, direct, she directed Yentl. Oh, oh, yeah, that's she's right. Directed, and she's, she's done some other stuff, too, but she, she's a heck of an actor. She's a hell of an actress, I should say. She's, she is. She's multi-talented. She's multi-talented, she's multi -talented and I would, have, I would have given a lot to have been able to just spend some time with her. Um, and she's, and she is very it. outspoken, very outspoken. She yeah. uses her platform, whether, you know, it's not always the safest thing with, you know, business, but she doesn't care. Plus, at this point, realistically... If she, she's worth, you know, more than gold. That's right. <laughs> and, and you know what? And I'm, and I'm happy for her too, because it looks like she'd been married to James Brolin, I think for about 22 years now, which it looks Long like time. it stood the test of time. I tell you what my, my favorite, um, and it gets panned, but I loved it because it's been made, let's see, in the thirties. The, so it was made, the original was with Janet Gaynor and Frederick March. Uh, Star is Born was made in the thirties. Then it was remade with Judy Garland in, in the 50s, which was a great one, and James Mason. Yes. It was recently done with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. But my favorite one is the 76 version with her and Chris Christopherson. Oh. I love that. Loved it. Everything she ever did, I loved it. Yeah. Singing, yeah. you know, um, she did Funny Girl. Yeah. I mean, everything she did, yeah. I, I, just, I just really loved her. I mean... And I loved, you know, I grew up loving Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Mm -hmm. I loved performance TV. I loved musicals. I, I mean, uh, I'm, that's at my core. Right. And so I would have to say Barbara Streisand, but then later on I would add on Karen Carpenter and okay. Chaka Khan. Chaka Khan sort of flipped my world around because I wasn't so totally 
accepted in the music that I loved of Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. And uh, my musical journey uh, lent itself to a Chaka Khan thing where it got funky. And right. Well, we're we'll starting out with Rufus and Chaka Khan, of course. Yes. Right. Yes. But you know, it's interesting. You mentioned, and it's funny how music, it, not they play that game six degrees or something, how something ties in. Well, you mentioned Prince. When her, I'm not going to say her career went down, but she wasn't as big as she once was. And in the 80s, she did like a, a you know, the, the I Feel For You, with yeah. more of a, more of like a, uh, I don't know, a dance beat to it yeah. than what Prince did. And it became a smash hit. It kind of brought her, I'm not going to say it brought her back, but it kind of yeah. brought her to a new audience. Yeah, it did yes, bring her back. That's fair to say. And, yeah. but, but it was, it was a Prince song. Yes. You know, and then, then you had um, Nothing Compares to You that Sinead O'Connor did, which was a Prince song. That's right. You know, or, or, or Manic Monday for the, for the Bengals, which was a print, which was a as print you know, song. I know you know this, but the viewers may not. Prince also wrote, a, wrote under a, a pseudo name, Alexander Nevermind. That's which right. Was, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah. And he wrote some of these songs that other artists had big hits on. Okay. So, so Barbara Streisand. Yes. Also the singer question that I ask, you're in the shower or you're jogging or you're on a long trip in the car. What song comes in your head frequently that you start humming or, or just it's one of those songs, whether it's something you sang or somebody else, but you, it's just a feel good song and it comes to you a lot. You know, I always get in the shower and I sing something that no one knows. It's a song that I wrote with this old gentleman and they called him Joey Two-Step. Okay. And he was a dancer. And okay. he was a little white guy that I absolutely loved him. He was a fan of mine. And okay. I used to sing in a band called um, Dr. Mambo's Combo. Okay. And I sang in that band with um, Margaret Cox and Melanie Rosales, who also okay. did lip sync for. Gotcha. And I met him, this old guy. And we wrote a song called Strange Moods. And the, the words, it's such a smoky jazz tune. And it's something that really gets my diaphragm and my, my um, brings my vocals to life. Okay. And the, the lyrics, our oldest strange mood has me feeling kind of low misery's coming to me and i'm feeling sort of gloomy so pardon me if there's tears in my eyes but strange moods often make me cry and then it goes on to talk about a love affair okay and i just love this man joey two-step and the song we wrote was amazing and maybe i'll i'll do a jazz album and and put it on there cool so that's, that's the song that nobody that, knows it. No, that's okay. That sounds cool. Just out of curiosity, the name of the band that you said, was it, it was it, because when you said that name, I'm not saying same music, but it kind of put me in a mindset of um, Kid Creole and the Coconuts. And um, he was with the other one before that was his brother's band, Dr. Buzzard and a Savannah band or something like that. Do you remember them from the 70s? They had like one hit, but it was a big, I just send you that too. You'll know it if you hear it. It starts out with about Tommy Mottola. But the name, the reason why I mentioned him is because the name of the band, you, you said, it sounded like it might be that type of music. I don't know if that's a fact, but. No, Dr. Mambo's combo, we would take songs and we would twist it and bend it around. Okay. Prince would come and hang out with us quite often. Okay. And sit in with us at that club. And then also there was uh, Michael Bland was there. We had great players. We had all uh, industry people in that band and it was quite a great time. Um, uh, and when Prince would come, I mean, we would just tear the club up. Gotcha. Yeah. Dr. Mambo's combo. Okay. Yeah. Favorite noise or sound? I would have to say laughter. Um, someone can laugh and I don't care where it's coming from, it's going to make me smile. Okay. You know, so I would have to say laughter. Okay. Flip that. Least favorite noise or sound? Someone out of control. 
someone uh, emotionally distraught, you know, just going off in a tizzy, that it's just uh, not a good thing. <laughs> okay. okay. Favorite food? Ooh. You know, I'm going to have to say, that's a hard one. Mm -hmm. What is my favorite food? You know, I'm a foodie okay. and I like fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds. So I'm going to have to say fruits. Okay. All fruits, tropical fruits, all kinds of fruit. All right. If you could hit the lottery. Now, when I say lottery, I'm talking about two, three, four hundred million dollar lottery. Boom. You hit it. What would be the first thing you do? Oh, the first thing is a difficult thing. I'd get an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing. But the first thing I'd want to do is open up a homeless center. Okay. In every state, if I could, and get the homeless off the street. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, I can't let you off the hook. Get an attorney for who you suing now. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I, I, I wouldn't sue, but I know that I would have so much money. Oh, oh, get it to, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Get an attorney because I, see, I misunderstood. I would have so much yeah. money that yeah. I think I would need an attorney. No, you would need several. Yeah, I, I got you. I didn't know you was going with that because we had talked about, the, yeah, I thought maybe somebody you needed, okay. No. I see what you're saying, because of, of the money. I got you. Yeah, all of I'm that. I'm tracking, I'm tracking. Gone. I'm, I'm way ahead of that. I got you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Uh, Pre-COVID, favorite vacation destination? I would have to say Costa Rica. Uh, anywhere where there's plants and tropics, uh, even along the water, um, nature. It could be anywhere. Okay. Yeah. I love nature. All right. Do you have a hobby? Um, I do a lot of things. You know, right now I'm writing a book from Funky Town to Higher Ground, and I'm about done with that. So I enjoy writing, but I would have to say um, I'm learning a guitar. So I love doing that. I like, um, you know, I like going in the churches and singing in different churches. I do a lot of different things. I'm probably one of the busiest persons in, in during COVID. I like to juice and give people nutrients and things like that and just um, try to make sure people are eating well. So I do a lot of stuff. Okay. And so I don't know, uh, I can't pick just one thing that I like. I like to walk along the river, you know, um, that brings me a lot of peace. Okay. You no, know, I got a lot of things that I like to do. Good. Now, if you could meet one person from any time in history, and they could be dead or alive, who would you like to meet? And what would your first question be for them? Uh, I think I would want to meet one person, one person. I would have to say Jesus. And my question would be, what are we supposed to do with this? Because, you know, I, I was raised a Christian. And um, the state of everything that's going on is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. COVID is difficult. Race relations are difficult. Um, the state of, of our institutions, it's all difficult. What are we supposed to do with it? I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I worry about my nephews <clears throat> driving to the grocery store. Will they be pulled over? What are we? How? What are? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to handle this? I mean, so I'm I'm 
perplexed by a lot of things that I see. And at the same time, you know, we're supposed to focus on love and light. And, and I try to do that. Um, but I've been swayed quite a bit this year. I understand. And I've had to ask, what do we do? You know, how can we get back to focusing on the things that are real and the things that are really important, the things that can move us in a direction of good. And I, I just, I don't always uh, have the, the faith that I would like to have. So I, I would really ask for some guidance. Okay, and, and I would, I'm gonna make a point off of that. I'd be remiss if I didn't say this uh, for the viewers. Uh, I'm very vocal on Twitter. Uh, my stance is against racism and uh, just social. My father, God rest his soul, um, marched with Dr. King, mm -hmm. fought against Anita Bryant uh, in the 70s when she was going against the uh, wow. community. So it's, in, it's ingrained in me. But I want to I wanna make a point because you said something, and, and I want to say it because uh, I've been saying it. You mentioned about your nephews driving to the grocery store. Now I am I am Italian and Russian, but I would be there's not a box to check, so I am Caucasian. Mm -hmm. I believe that there is such thing as white privilege, and mm -hmm. I and I admit that, and I feel that um, white people don't always have to feel guilty of everything that's always happened, but you need to acknowledge that there is white privilege, and I do, and and I use my white privilege. Absolutely, I, I use my white privilege because my son is um, half black. Okay, mm -hmm. so and my better half is African-American. Mm -hmm. And I know that my white privilege, in, that I and, it, and it shouldn't be that I have to say this, but it's the truth. I know <laughs> that when I say something, uh, unfortunately in this country and the world for that matter, I don't wanna just pick on America because I yeah. do love America with all of its warts. I don't wanna yeah. live in any other, any other country, but I call it out when it's wrong. Using my white privilege, I tell people all the time because they make me mad when they say, you know, I don't, I, first of all, I don't say all cops are bad and I don't say all cops are good. I say that I back good cops that are good and the bad ones, I don't stand by. That's why I don't back That's the blue. Right. I don't believe in back the blue. I back good cops. And yep. I don't back cops. I don't back good cops that stand by bad cops because then that makes you the same. That's right. Where I'm going with that point is this. You just mentioned your nephews going to the store. I get so tired of hearing people that look like me that say, well, if, if, uh, that black person or African American person would just comply. No, it shouldn't be just comply. If your nephew gets pulled over because he didn't put a turn signal on, or a uh, uh, me, I'm gonna use me, and I get pulled over, we should get treated the same. Meaning, yeah. you come to the car, you're respectful of the police officer. The police officer is respectful of you. Not you have to have your hand here and here and yes, sir, no, sir, and you know, and like a robot because you're scared because the complexion of your skin might get you killed. That's a reality. So when you say it, and I I agree with you, Cynthia, and I've taught and I talk to people all the time about this. I don't want to hear just comply. That's not the answer, just comply. The mm -hmm. answer is that you have another person of color that talks about something that is real and goes on in your community. And I always tell people, use your voice and speak up. That's a reality. And I respect you for saying it. And I, and I, I stand by what you said, because dog, doggone it, I know it's true. It's not just, oh, it's yeah. always about race. No, it's not always about race, okay? And sometimes things are made about race and they're not about race. You know, let's, it happens. That's true, that's that true. That happens too. You know, where, where, I, where I call that out, I call out somebody and I'm honest, being honest, it's just my opinion, and I'm entitled to it, just like you're entitled to yours, and everybody else is entitled to theirs. But I have a hard time with anybody, person of color, voting for Donald Trump because I think he's a racist. And I think it's voting against your community, your... So I call it out what I see is right and wrong, whether it's white people, black people, whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I want to piggyback on what you said because of the fact that it's so very important. I want viewers to hear this because it's it's music and all of this, all of these things are beautiful, but this also is reality. And it's yes, a shame sir. that in 2021 almost, that you have to worry about your nephews or whomever going to the store because we live in a society where people still to this day are not treated the same. And we've digressed. We've moved ahead okay. some, 
but we've digressed. I mean, honestly, with the exception of maybe dogs being put on black people in the 60s and fire hoses, which if there would have, and I'm sorry, I'm saying if there was a second term of Trump, we probably would have had that too because okay. Bill Barr would have been in there and he would have authorized it. Yeah. So that, that's reality. So I, my point, to, to kind of get off topic, but to tie in what you said, I respect what you said and I stand by what you said and I'm glad that you said it because it's a, it's a, it's a reality and it's something that needs to be talked about, not whispered in back rooms and say, well, yeah, but, but, but there's no buts. There's no more buts. There's no buts. There is now no is the buts. time. And, and, and you just said too, you're a person of faith, but you're, you're, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe in organized religion anymore, but I'm very spiritual and I believe in God. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. It's a whole nother show if I, if I were to explain, but right. you said it's hard because your faith gets tested because, yes. you, you know, and I understand. And I think God understands it. I, I literally said to Debbie yesterday in, in the car that God gave us to me, the strongest thing that he could possibly give man free will, free and will. What we did with it though, his heart has to be broken. And, and, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, a, a extremist on one side and I'm not extremist. I'm trying to be down the center. Mm -hmm. But what we've done with, with free will across the board, all people is not, is not relegated um, um, to one race, one gender, one That's right. ethnic, uh, ethnic group across That's the right. board. That's what right. What we've with it is just, it's, and, and I'm piggybacking off of your other thought because of great talking points about testing of your faith. I understand it. It's a, it's a fair thing. You know, people get mad and they say, well, you believe in God, Brad, you can't accept somebody that doesn't. I said, no, I can. I can accept somebody that, that uh, as long as they accept that I do, you know, yeah. you know, as long as you, you accept where I'm at, I'll try to accept where you're at. Most of the time I will, as long as you're not pushing it down my throat. But, right. You know, as, as you said, it, it's gotten very hard because people have um, bastardized and prostituted, very, two very strong words, organized religion and interpretation that that's not what it's there for. And it's sad. It breaks my heart. It's, it's, there's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot going on. And, and I, you know, I have friends who are, um, I have friends who are Trump supporters. I have friends who are uh, white and black Trump supporters, friends mm. who are QAnons. Oh, Lord, they couldn't be my friends no more. I oh, don't yeah. do any of those three. You're better than I mean, me. This is, this is me being tested all the time. Right. And I, you know, trying to have conversations that make sense you can't it's so difficult you and, can't. and and still be loving and still you know not i mean it's it's difficult and and me a woman in my 60s have been pulled over on the freeway with a gun drawn i mean so i know this stuff is real yes. and it is hard to navigate and stay hopeful. I have my good days and I have my bad days, you know? My good days outweigh my bad days, but I've been tested. Well, I'm gonna tell you what, you've done better with that test than me because I, I, I don't pull no punches. If you're a Trump supporter, I'm done. If you're queuing <laughs> on, I'm not even trying. Uh, and, and not that you have to have all of my views, because I, quite honestly, before Trump, I never had a problem with a Republican or a Democrat. Difference of policies. I said, fine. Yep. I, and, I'm not, and, I, and I never became, I'm not really political. People think I am because I'm so outspoken, but I'm really not political. I'm, I'm really in the middle because I'm, I'm a liberal on social issues. And me I'm a conservative too. on fiscal issues, so I'm really... Yeah, me too. You know, I, too. I believe in a, a hand up, not a hand out. You know, yep, I want people to handle, but not, you can't, you can't just be on, on the government tip your whole life and not try to get ahead. That just, that's just me talking. But I agree. But, you know, I, I had this discussion with Mary L. Trump, his niece, who can't stand him. And, and we were in agreement. I said, Mary, I, I can't. She said, oh, I understand. And she's a psychologist. So when I talk to her, it's like a free session. But, <laughs> but you know, it's, I said, I, I can't do it because I said, you said you got friends that are Trump supporters. This, this is just me. I'm not trying to sway you, Cynthia, but this is just me. Because my son is, is half black, 
because Debbie is African American. I feel if and, and Donald Trump showed you, there's no oh hi because their favorite is how do you know he's a racist? I'm not even going to spend another 40 minutes on the show explaining because you know how. I already know. Right. He showed he doesn't hide it. But and the my thing was, if you support a racist, okay, and you know he is what he is, the least he's the least racist person. If if they asked him, if if you had to ask God for forgiveness, he said nothing. Who says nothing? I've got more things. I, I would be it would be like a, a a laundry list of things I'd ask God for forgiveness for. But I I agree with everything you're saying, except I can't become that person in the opposite. I hear you. I understand. You I, I respect that, it. I mean, if that person is spewing hate, I can't house that in here. Right. Because it affects my music and it affects my love and it affects my energy and it affects, it's not, it doesn't belong in my body. That's why I couldn't stay in the music that didn't feel like love. Right. And I can't condemn them for my ex-husband or the, my lips experience for what made them who they were. That was their thing. And I can only say that my contribution has to be love. And if I'm not loving, then I need to back up. That's out of all my relationships, even my friend, who's a QAnon, a black QAnon. Lord have mercy. I have to love her because she doesn't know. And when I was 20, I was a different person that didn't know. When I was in this music business, I didn't know. I was young. Nobody teaches you how to go right. And wherever you were traumatized, this isn't the result of that. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I know, and I, and I respect the navigation. The board. I respect the board. And because you're on this road now doesn't mean you'll be on that road then. The ex-husband that I married doesn't have to be a hateful, spiteful person now who couldn't deal with the fact that, you know, I was, you know, being a star or whatever his thing was. Right. I can't condemn him for his understanding or his experience. He'll get it. He'll get there, or not. But I'm moving on, and I'm a love you. And I respect. Yeah, I, I understand where you come from. I respect it. I'm a love you, and I'm gonna walk away from it, and I'm gonna try to give you love whenever I have the opportunity. Okay. That's all I can do. That's all you can do, I, and I respect you for it. But but I, I what I what I can say but is that I'm it. still loving. I can't do it because and and the reason why no I can't do it because honestly, I always say. If you like me, warts and all, you own all of me. So their thing is with, with and, and this is Trump. This is really Trump related. Kids, I don't even want to go into all the things he's done. Everybody knows it's out there. But when it comes to racism, I can't. I, it's a bridge too far. It, there's, it, there was a, look when he attacked. I was in the military. John oh. McCain was. John McCain was. I didn't agree politically with most of what Senator McCain stood for. But what I will not allow anybody to do, whether they're on the left, the right, the center, or the far outskirts, is change the narrative that Senator McCain, God rest his soul, oh was God. not a war hero. It was he could so not lift difficult. his arm up to comb his hair. He was in a Hanoi Hilton, and these are facts, I'm only talking facts. Five and a half years in Hanoi Hilton, could not comb his hair. This oh. SOB said, I like my, and by the way, five deferments his daddy paid for. And I'm not even mad about that because a lot of rich people back then didn't go. That's so right. I'm not even mad about that. That's I'm true. not even mad about that. But, you know, don't compare yourself to Muhammad Cassius Clay at the time who gave up everything and didn't go. You paid. But that's fine. I could even live with that because a lot of rich people did. But don't lie about it. That's my thing. Don't lie about it. When you, when he said the Hollywood Access tape, Okay, oh, what he oh, said, and, oh, and they wanted to spin it, and, but they wanted to spin it, Cynthia. And he said, "Locker room talk." I, like I said, I pull no punches ever. I'm brutally honest to a fault. I'm a man. I have used locker room talk. There's a difference between locker room talk that and me saying 
I am so and so. I can move on that woman who was married, okay, like a you know what, because I'm Donald Trump. No, you cannot. That's rape. End of discussion. That should have ended. End of discussion. And people have supported him and have used religion. Yes. To yes. make those things okay. And right. it's not okay. Well, but you know what? But you said, but I'm going to piggyback one more thing before we finish up the last couple of questions. Because you, you brought up a, a good point. It's a great talking point. You said you got friends that are white and black Trump supporters. This is why they can't be my friends anymore. <laughs> one, one of the main reasons. This is America. Me personally, I support Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. Me too. Because he took it. We know why, but I always put it back out there because some of my viewers who listen to me know that, I, that with me, you're going to get the truth. And they know they can go research this and say, what I said was really what happened. Not an interpretation of or yes. alternative facts like Kellyanne Conway uses. Yes. And Kaylee McEnany is freaking press secretary. I right. give them facts. He took a knee, as you know, I'm not trying to tell you, it's more for the viewers, mm -hmm. because of what was being done to the African-American community by policing. But he took a knee because someone that was in the army who was Caucasian reached out to Colin and said, do me a favor for us, because it looks better if you take a knee, it's more respectful. And Colin, listen to this guy, and you can research this, he was in the army, he took a knee. Now... This is America. I always say you have a right not to like that Colin took a knee. I'm not going to tell you that. Right? That's right. Just like I have the right to stand with him. But what you don't have the right to do is change the narrative of why Colin kept. It's not. And, and they changed the narrative for a reason. Of course they do. Of course. First of all, I was in the military. This is what the, most of these people. And I know you're going to laugh, but this is the truth. Most of these freaking people that uh, talk about this, they never even served in the Salvation Army, let alone the United States Army. That's very true. We take an oath. You see the flag behind me. That's one of the flags that from when I was in the military. I raised my hand several times to the Constitution of the United States of America, not to the flag. And I'm not a flag burner, even though people have a right to burn the flag. I don't agree with that. Spin on, that's not my thing. Right. But what I say with the flag is this. They bastardized and they prostituted our American flag with this Trump 2020 flag flying right. under it, which you've never seen in your lifetime. And you're only maybe 10 years older than me, if that. So we're not that far apart. So my point is, you've never seen in your lifetime, Republican or Democrat, have a flag. That's all about branding. That's his freaking branding crap. Trump 2020 to me, is the equivalent of the Confederate flag, okay? MAGA, make America great again, let's be honest. When was America completely great for people that look like you or for, uh, in, for Indians yeah. or, or even Italians? I'm half Italian. Italians who support Trump, I always say, how do you support him when we came, my great-grandfather came to Ellis Island, we were called WAPs without paper, we were called Dagos. We were spit on and called greaseball. We were called all of these things, but you forget. And Trump says, make America great again. Who was it great for? Let's well, make it know, better. It was great for. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. So my, my whole point of making those points is that I respect you and I love you for what you do, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It's, yeah, well. It, it, I can't do know, it. It's like you, you almost have to keep an opening for conversation because then all we are is this but there are ways to come together and things to come together over some people don't even understand all that QAnon believes in and some of those people that i'm talking about better <laughs> That's okay. No, I got to laugh. Now, I'm going to edit uh, some of this, some of the dead space, because oh, this is the good. first time, this is a learning experience. So this is the first time that's happened. But I had to laugh because I was like, and I'm going to curse now, so don't feel offended. Oh my I was gosh. Like, I was like, holy shit, QAnon got her. I thought <laughs> QAnon got you. <laughs> I was like, they got her. They came in the house. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, my battery's dead. <laughs> oh, no. I'm are you on, are you no. on your... Uh, are you on your cell or are you on your, your computer? 
I'm on my computer. Okay. I'm All on right. my laptop. Well, I'm going to edit. There's a lot of, de- I'm, still re- I'm still recording. Good. Folks, I'm going to be editing some dead space, so it might look a little weird. I'll see how I do the best that I can with this. Okay. <laughs> so we, we kind of got off on, on some talking points. We ended on that I understand where you're coming from. You understand where I'm coming from. And I was saying we yeah. can't close communication. If, if, if I didn't know that they were QAnon or Trump supporters, or, there would still be love between us. So I can't stop the love from flowing because they're ignorant or they don't understand that they're not being, they're not, you know, because but, of- But where can the conversation go though? My thing is, where does the conversation go? The conversation goes to them understanding that what they're, they think they're in is not what they're in. What you think that you're being loving for, because they really think, oh no, you know, God, this, they put God in this. I know. And, 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 and he's, 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 we've got to save the children. He's yes. going to bust up the pedophilia ring. Yeah, yeah Donald they Trump. They really think that this is what's happening. I know. And so there's some veil over their eyes and over their mind. And I can't not, I can't completely close them down if that's what they think is true. And they still have an ability to be loving people. Okay, so what I'm gonna do for you, since I'm a lo- I am a loving person, but I can't tolerate any bullshit. So what I'm gonna do for you is for free, I'm not even gonna charge you. Uh, you have my cell phone number and you have my email and when you after you talk to them and you want to just i'm not gonna say bang your head against the wall but just like hit up every one of those bottles at the same time even though i'm, I'm not saying that that's what you do but that's probably what it would cause you to do uh feel free to reach out to me and i'll remind you that i told you i won't even say i told you so but i will just remind you that see there's there, because honestly when there was a difference look I saw a video. I saw a video where they called cheese pizza, and I'm Italian, half Italian. I eat. I love pizza. Cheese pizza really stands for child pornography. I, I ordered 22 pizzas just because of that. Child pornography and cheese pizza. It's a. It's a. You Tom know, Hanks is. Brad, I'm not saying that it's not tough. <laughs> it's tough. Oh yes, it is. It's really tough. But the idea that they can feel that they can still love me and be my friend and knowing how I feel. I certainly can't close the door completely and say, I'm not going to talk to you. Okay, but I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to be the devil's advocate. You're a woman of color. If they support Trump, he's a racist. You don't get to pick and choose. If I like you, I, I like everything about you. If they're over there saying... She's mean to waitresses, and you are mean to the Uber driver, and you are mean to all these people. And I say, but she's nice to me. Being a person of color, I, that, to me, I'm, I'm not a person of color, but I can't because the way I was brought up, except that they, because I feel that if you support a racist, you either hate the same things, or you're a racist in some way, shape, or form. And I just... I, I can't get with it. I can't. And look, we all have our, and, and there's, and, and I'm, a, I'm as brutally as honest as I could be. We all, me included, we all have our prejudices. Sometimes yes. we don't even realize them. That's right. But it's a bridge too far for a guy that to this day says the Central Park Five should have been put to death. They were kids. They were exonerated. They served time in prison. His father, and I've talked to Mary L. Trump about this extensively on my show. I've had two times, three hour shows combined. Nobody has her on for that long. We talked about this where, as you know, in the seventies, he put either C or N, N for Negro or C for colored on housing applications when he was running his father's slumlord apartment. Oh, you know, we we don't disagree. We don't disagree about any of this. Right. And, and, and I stand firm on how I feel. Right. I have a stepson who's a, who's, who's a Trump supporter. Oh, God. Mm. What do I do with that? I, I, I can't hate my 
stepson. Well, no, I'm not saying hate. I'm not well, saying I'm just, hate. I'm just yeah. saying. Right. I, and I have my opinion. And right. the best way to get my opinion across, if you have blinders on, or if you're racist yourself, or if you think this person is something that you just refuse to see, I can't stop loving you because of your ignorance. I can't. Yeah. Okay. I can't stop loving you because you haven't opened your eyes. I can't stop loving you because you can't put one and one together and make two. I just have to believe that you're ignorant and oh, you're definitely the, ignorant. <laughs> and you're not on you're not on the same road as me yet. Okay. And I can't I can't close you down. I got you. I, I hear you. I hear you. You you watch Don Lemon? Yes. Okay, so you know how Don says there's the uni there's the reality, the the universe, and then there's the alternate universe. They're in the alternate universe, and I'm sorry, I can't send a spaceship for them. So, I, but I hear you. I understand. And a lot of people, a lot of people, feel the way that you do. And and I and but see, but I can have this conversation with you. I'm not going to belittle you or put you. We could we could agree to disagree, but I understand where you're coming from. And but you're you're coming from a place of love and logic. But you're also not insulting me or me insulting you, for that matter, to say I don't understand where you're coming from because I do. And you yeah, understand. I agree with you. Right. No, but what I'm saying is, but we're, <laughs> but we're, we're speaking in logical terms. We, I understand the position that you have, but you, but you also acknowledge. See, that's the problem I have with that side is that policies. George Bush, fine. We could talk policies. If I didn't know enough about the policy, I said I don't know enough about it to speak about it. Mm -hmm. But it's not with this guy here. It's good versus evil. There is no more, like Chris Cuomo calls it. They're called the Republicans. There's no more Republican Party because I have I have friends that are Republicans. I could care. To be honest with you, I've told people I was a Democrat. I became a Republican, and now I'm an Independent. When he when he won, I left the party and I became Independent because again, I'm part Republican. I'm part Democrat. Yeah, I'm really in the middle. So and honestly, being an Independent. I could vote for whoever I want, even though I would have done it anyways. I would, you know, I, I, I don't, if it's a decent Republican, I'll say it's a decent Republican. Same here. But it's the good versus the evil part. Okay. That's what it's about. It's right. the good versus the evil part. And I believe that the evil can be converted or can change. Okay. I I'm going to throw, I'm gonna throw you an amen and a hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you got the voice, you sing to the angels. And if, if you make, I tell you what, no names mentioned. You, you're going to have access to me for, for eternity. Okay. When you cross one of them over, I don't want to know no names out of respect for their privacy. <laughs> you contact me however you want. You text me, you call me, you email me, and you say, hey, one Cynthia zeroed their side. And I'll know exactly, that'll be our running joke. One or two, I want you to be able to, you know, how we used to do four and then put the line. I forget what they call that. But, you know, the kids today probably wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Back or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, whatever it is, you know. <laughs> Debbie would know what this thing is. Today, they don't know what a pay phone is. You tell them, go use the pay phone. They were like, how does this work? Oh, but, my gosh. But, um, okay, when you win one over, and I, win one over means they come over. I won't even say completely to your side if they just leave Trump and QAnon and come in the center. I'm good. All right. Oh, I got to have hope. I got to have hope. I hear you. I hear you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So back to you. With everything we discussed, if you had to sum yourself up before Q and I get you again and you, it goes dead, they already were sending you hate email. You got Q and I. Be careful. Now the thing is rocking. If <laughs> I see somebody with tinfoil on her head at, your, at the door behind you, I'm running. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so oh. with, every, <laughs> with everything we discussed to this point, if you had to sum yourself up, Cynthia, as a human being, what would be a couple thoughts that you would say? Uh, empathetic. Mm -hmm. um, hopeful. I got to have hope. Um, forgiving. I'd have to say those three. Okay. 
I don't usually chuckle when somebody says that because it's a serious question. But because we had that conversation, all I can say is bless you. But I mean it in a sincere way, not bless you, bless, right. bless them, the sarcastic one. I sincerely, I, I sincerely, I should say, do bless you. Okay. Out of all the interviews you've ever done, solo interviews, or, well, we know you didn't do them with lips now. That pisses right. me off. But right. again, I, like I said, that's the lady that you heard on Funky Town. Um, but as a solo artist or other groups and the interviews, whether they were big or small, was there ever a question that you had wished that you were asked by an interviewer and you weren't? And if there is a question, what would it be? I don't know. I mean, um, back during those days, I would never say anything that would upset anyone. I'm not like that anymore. And so um, I, I'm more of a willing person. I speak freely because I don't feel like I'm uh, under someone's thumb. Mm -hmm. And I have nothing to hide and nothing to be ashamed of. So whatever someone asks me, it's fair game. I can decide to answer or not. So there's nothing that I wish someone would have asked me because I would have said it. Okay. I would have said it whether they asked me or not. <laughs> okay. okay. And finally, the question I always close out on, do you have a saying you live your life by? And if you do, what is it? Um, you know, my, my parents had a ton of them. <clears throat> and the only one I can think of right now is the one that I mentioned before. Whatever you accept in life is fair. If you accept that, then that's fair. You have accepted it and you should um, uh, expect that because you, you were willing. You were willing, you participated. And so therefore it's fair. It's not someone else's fault. They didn't do it to you. You accepted those circumstances. So whatever you accept is fair. And I don't accept just anything anymore. When I walked away from Lips Inc. because I didn't feel love in that situation. I didn't feel like I could bond and make partnerships and real relationships. I don't uh, do those things anymore. Okay. I walk away from something that, that's not working. So um, did I answer the question? Yeah, you did. No, you, no, 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 you did. You did good. You did good. All right. I want to give you the microphone, the platform. And what I would like you to do, if you would, please, is send out, we talked about COVID at the beginning. But I always like all of my guests, because we're all in this together, I, I always say humanity is the biggest thing of all. Um, be part of the, the solution, not the problem. Um, if you would, a positive message to people uh, dealing with COVID and a message to all your fans over the years. The microphone and the platform is yours. Um, a message for COVID uh, survivors. Um, I'm um, and for those who haven't got it, uh, contracted the virus, and those who have it now and may have it, what you put in your body is so important right now. I mean, we, the, our leadership is not telling us what to do and how to heal our body. You cannot heal your body without proper nutrients from the earth. If you have had the virus, going to have the virus, haven't had it yet, prepare your body, put on some sort of armor, and that armor is nutrition. Okay. Do it, do it, do it. Do it before, do it after, do it during, and you will far better fare to get that stuff out of your system. And so that's my recommendation. And to all those who have lost family members, 
my heart is with you and I, I wish I could solve the world's problems, but we will always have them and um, I just send out love to them. For my fans that have been so loyal to me, every, um, every email that I get, I return because there's love and there's memories attached to it. And I just have loved everyone who's called me and requested uh, either music or uh, a note back or um, a photograph or a signature. I just send it. And I'm just so grateful that they have given me that love. And I hope that in some way that I have returned it back to them. Um, and I won't stop trying if I haven't. And so thank you. I am forever grateful and uh, just have wells of gratitude uh, just flowing into my heart. And I'm just so thankful. Okay. Yeah. And as well, tell them, tell the viewers uh, where they can find you social media wise. I'm not much of a gadget social media person, uh, but I do have a website, uh, CynthiaJohnson.net. I am writing a book, two books. Um, one I have uh, finished uh, called From Funky Town to Higher Ground. Uh, and then I have a book called um, Beating the Odds, A Journey to Wellness. It talks about nutrition and the importance of taking care of your body temple, why it's important. Uh, and uh, that's a long conversation, but it's a simple remedy. And so those books will be for sale and you'll be able to find them on my website. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, I appreciate you coming on. It was a pleasure talking to you. Much Definitely much a pleasure. Respect. I, I thank you so much because you're such a real loving heart. I know you you got some tough in you, but there's more love in you. <laughs> oh, than, there is. There is. Yes, I know because I can feel it. And oh, so I, I appreciate you very much. And I thank you for that. You got access to me. So when the books come out, we'll bring you back on. Okay. We can talk about the books then. I look uh, forward to it. And uh, you always, if you just need a platform because you feel that you want to say something important, hit me up. I have you back on. I tell all my guests that, you know, these, these are interviews, but they're more conversations. Yes. You know, I always feel a, a, like a kindred spirit to, uh, to good people. And, yes. and thank you as well for giving uh, your God-given ability back uh, to humanity through the saxophone, through singing, mm -hmm. through looking out for people, because... We need more of that and less of, and it's not just Trump. I don't want to put everything on Trump. We've had problems way before Trump. He just, yes. he just exasperated it. But yes. we have to, we, we're never going to be perfect. We're not. That's, that's not realistic. No. Every, I, every, I always close my show with every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. And you, and you do that through your music and artists do that through whatever medium they do it through, whether it's a painting or a, whatever it is. So I thank you as well. And I'm going to say it one more time because I'm very big on giving people credit. Ladies and gentlemen watching this show, this is the lady I'm pointing, even though you're not supposed to point, but I'm making a point. That's all right. That is the lady that you heard. Not, let me show this one more not time. Not anybody else. Not anybody else <laughs> looking like this. And it's not, a, it's not a, a, a thing I'm trying to pick on someone. I just want you to know that this is the lady which is actually, I love Funky Town, I'm not going to lie, but yes. I, when I interviewed Wayne Chung, everybody says, oh, you know, everybody have fun tonight, which I, uh, um, I love that song. My favorite song by them is to live and die in LA. But mm -hmm. everybody ha has their favorites. My favorite is designer music. I've been playing it. I, I always tell everybody, I, while I do research on you, I have it on loop. So it just plays it over and over and over again. <laughs> and it makes me think of stuff that I want to, that I, you know, I put you in the, in the music, even though I had a feeling and once again, my gut was right that there was a story there with, with uh, Lip Sync. And I'm glad that you told it. Like you said, it may be different a little bit, but it's your story. And yes. I support you. And again, thank you, thank you for coming on. And uh, remember what I said when you break open one of those bottles behind you, that what they said, you could say all you want, but them QAnon, tinfoil wearing... It's rough. Oh, it's more than rough, darling. It's, rough. it's more than rough. Oh my God. 
and 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 I boxed and everything else, and I ain't never faced an opponent like them in my life. Oh like my said, gosh! I've never is... fallen out over anything political. It's not political with me anymore. Yeah, I I, I feel you, Brad. It's 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 a tough life. It's tough out here. That that's why. If Jesus, I mean, if I could ask him, I'm telling you, I right. got some conversation because I don't get it. Right. I understand. It's been a pleasure. It's such a pleasure to meet you. I enjoy your show. I love how real you are and how much you come from your heart. And so, you know, much success, much love to you. I, I appreciate you so much. All right. Thank you for this time. Absolutely. Take care. Good night. Good night. <laughs> All right, folks, that's another Bad Brad Berkwood show in the can. Cynthia Johnson, the voice of Funky Town. I said it, what, 10 times? Because I want people to know she was the voice of the song that so many of you and myself loved when I was in the sixth grade at Treasure Island Elementary School in North Bay Village in Florida. They used to play it. Like I said, it was one stereo, speakers like this, record player came down, Yellow insert, 45, put it on. But they also had the, um, the album, the 33. That's the type of interviews you get. We talk about everything. And sometimes we go off topic because we're human beings and there's issues that mean stuff to both of us, to, to my guests, to me. And we find common ground and we discuss those things. Again, Cynthia Johnson, saxophone player, vocalist. And check out that video that I mentioned on the show, Higher Ground. Type in... Cynthia Johnson, Higher Ground, fantastic. I mean, she was, vocal was way up there. And, and the uh, ABC Youth uh, Choir was the bomb. All right, folks, that's another show in the can. Forget about it. Make sure you subscribe. Leave your comments below. I greatly appreciate it. And remember, forget about it. As always, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Bad Brad out. <laughs>